what I wanted to talk about, I'd be interested to hear your feedback and all, is, is a concept that says that music is a core function of cognition in the brain. This is work that's based on uh, the work by Michael Tout, who was a colleague of mine at uh, Colorado State University. And uh, Michael is uh, a German-born musical scientist. And he is a director of the Center for Biomedical Research in Music. And he's sort of the, uh, one of the creators of neuro music, um, music therapy, neurological music therapy. So I became very interested in his work in this because obviously my life is dedicated to music and music education. And there's quite a lot of crossover in brain research and impact when you're thinking about music education and education in general. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about, about this. And this came from an article, The Musical Brain, An Artful Biological Necessity. I'll get it. But essentially, one of the things we're seeing is that the modern mind uh, came into being 50,000 to 100,000 years ago. And that the archaeological record shows that the emergence of artifacts that were attributed, that these artifacts must be attributed to a cognitively modern mind. And so interestingly, when you look at the archaeological record, these modern minds were already artistic. They were already showing artful behaviors. And that this was integral to human activity from the very beginning. Um, so what's very interesting about this is that these artworks and this evidence of artistic behaviors predate written language. Um, and also mathematical codes in the archaeological record. Uh, and, and this is by tens of thousands of years. So here's a timeline that uh, Dr. Tao uh, lays out for us. 200,000 years ago, there are weapons and tools that were developed that had more beauty than is really needed for their function. So somebody's decorating these or polishing them or something. So that's the beginning of artistic you know, knowledge. So we still hadn't moved out of Africa at this point. Um, 70,000 years ago, there were cave paintings with significant aesthetic qualities to them. 50,000 years ago, drawings and sculptures began to appear that have recognizable images. 38,000 years ago, this was recently found, just last year, the oldest musical instrument, which is a bone flute, was found in South Germany. And it had five holes on it. We'll see a picture of it in a minute. 30,000 years ago, flutes, rattles, whistles, and percussion instruments um, were found. 16,000 years ago, rock engravings of dancers, which of course implies that music was being performed. And uh, then 10,000 years ago, music instruments were found in large numbers. In other words, they found enough in one area that it, it was the size of a modern day orchestra or band or large choir. So this, this is, you know, we're now into ensembles, and this is 10,000 years ago. And 4,100 years ago, a set of six pipes tuned in octaves with a high degree of craftsmanship um, and artistry. This is found in Ireland, of course. These were uh, figurines found 23,000 years ago in Lower Austria. These are figurines that were found on the University of Central Missouri campus this afternoon. <laughs> and I want to a picture on my iPhone. Uh, so this, is, this represents a very important step um, in the development of the mind because these figurative artworks began to embody symbolic representations. In other words, they were created to stand for something else. So a very important um, turning point in the development of the modern mind. And so what uh, Dr. Chow explains is interesting is that the simultaneous appearance of art with modern human beings during this ice age suggests that these artistic abilities did not evolve gradually, but basically appeared in a very short time span. So basically, this starting hypothesis that this really says to us is that music and the arts, they're not the icing on the cake that just appeared after our basic needs were met. In other words, after we were sleeping and eating and reproducing, these were not, this wasn't the icing on the cake. 
but instead it was necessary for the basic survival and the societal needs of the modern human mind. That it was fundamental to human brain function. When you think about music in the mind, unlike language or visual arts, music cannot express meaning in a direct manner. There's no chord that means something. There's no melody that means something. You know, like a, a painting can actually mean something, or language can depict something directly. We can only depict music, uh, you know, derive meaning through association. You go to a wedding, you hear the wedding music, you know, you think wedding, but that's through association. It's not because of certain chords or a melody. Uh, so music's purely abstract in its expression. So what is music? Uh, one definition of music is that it, it basically it communicates the beauty and the construction of itself, of its own sound patterns, sound patterns that occur in the brain. And that the brain really enjoys creating and sharing these patterns with other brains. And so the premise of this is that all musicians, all humans, all humans can think in these abstract musical sound patterns. And so this is probably not learned then, but biologically hardwired into the human brain. Um, so what this hypothesis says then is that the brain is thinking in multiple languages, that they're thinking obviously in verbal, which we're communicating in right now, also in numbers, which we can communicate in, but also in non-verbal structures of uh, music and visual art. And that the, that the ability to think in music is fundamental to all human brains. So, when you get this neuroscience, you know, this imagery, the brain imagery that they can do now is, creates a lot of ability to study things. And so I'm going to boil this down. This is very long, very deep. I'm boiling down a couple of statements. They're saying that the neural circuitry in the brain, when they study music and when they study language, and they're comparing language and music, they're saying some of it is in different places in the brain and some of it is shared. In other words, when they measure through neuroimaging response, brain response, let's say there's a syntax violation in grammar or in music, the same areas have a response in the brain. Um, let's say that you're doing musical improvisation or composition. The same areas respond in the brain as doing verbal tasks or linguistic tasks. And so what this means is that a supramodal, in other words, a mode that controls other areas, a mode of thinking, begins to process syntax and sequence in both music and in language. And then, so when we, if we were to take this a step further, then if we train this supramodal area, in other words, this neural circuitry that controls syntax and sequence and all, if we were to train this in multiple areas, not just language, but language, numbers, and music, that we, this, we, this may impact cognitive operations that are based in this network of the brain. So... <laughs> When you study music, one of the things that controls all music is rhythm. That is sort of like the harness for all of music is rhythm. And rhythmic performance, the ability to perform rhythmically, is associated with increased scores of general intelligence tests. And increases in the white matter volume, white matter volume in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And musical training is associated with increases in academic and other cognitive abilities. So basically, music and the arts are critical languages of the brain. So in conclusion, what this evidence is saying is, it's very strong, is that early human brain activity that was artful and artistic was, was not accidental. But in fact, it was the foundation for the emergence of the modern cognitive brain and the modern human mind. Um, and so um, that sort of changes the paradigm just a little bit in my mind about why music and why music education and why it's so important uh, to us in our society and why it's important to us in our schools and why it's important to all of us.